I invite you to keep your Bibles open to Acts 8, which is what we'll be uh, learning from this morning. And uh, let's pray. Lord, uh, what a beautiful picture of the way your Spirit sent Philip to uh, the right person at just the right time to speak just the right words from you so that he could be transformed. And God, you have sent Luke, the evangelist who wrote the book of Acts, to bring this message to us, your gospel, at just the right time for us to transform us. I pray that we would be open to what you want to do today in our hearts through life-changing word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So some kids play basketball. That's me. Other kids live and eat and breathe basketball. That was the Grace College basketball camp in Winona Lake, Indiana. That's where the kid who played basketball got gobbled up by kids who lived basketball. Had to be about 12 or 13. My parents dropped me off there with one other acquaintance from my school who would be my roommate for a few nights. On day one, the reality set in that of the 100 plus ballers that were there, I was pretty competitive. I had to be maybe second or third worst. (laughs) Um, These guys had the killer crossovers. They had outstanding free throw percentages. They could slice through the paint, steal a sloppy dribble, and then they could drain the three under pressure. No problem. And I thought I was just there to learn a couple skills, learn how to shoot, but these guys were awesome. I felt dumb being worse than everybody else. But sports were always more about the friends than they were the sport. My father liked to call me Mr. Congeniality. If I was out there having fun with the guys, I called that a win. My soccer coaches and captains expected us to be sour and silent whenever we lost. And I went along with it, though I couldn't relate to the feeling, because at least we lost together. So what? I was worst at basketball camp. At least I could make some friends, right? Well, one night I strolled down the hallway with my Mr. Congeniality heart on my sleeve to go make some friends. I was a lone soccer player in this world of ballers, but I thought we could make this work. So I struck up a conversation with some guys and thought things were going well, till they wrapped up my arms and pulled a common junior high hazing ritual on me. And I'd been told to believe that that's just boys having fun, so I laughed it off, not coming to understand bullying until much later in my life. Well, that was a lonely moment. A confused adolescent boy who felt like an outsider to basketball, now shoved further outside by insecure boys. But I would not give up. On another occasion, I stumbled across a room full of boys who somehow got a hold of some pizza one night. They must have had insider connections. But something wonderful happened. They offered me a piece. They were inviting that outsider in. So craving some pizza, I healed like a well-bred puppy and bit into the warm pizza. And then the hall erupted into laughter. What were they laughing at? Someone said, hey, lift up the cheese. As I peeled the cheese back from the crust, a long, stringy glob of snot stretched out like a rubber band under the cheese. Yet again, there was Andrew providing the entertainment, make him think he's on the inside, and then wham, kick him back out to the outside. But hey, at least I had my roommate, my friend from my little Christian school. I could always retreat back to him, you would think. I don't recall when it happened, but he stopped talking to me that week. I don't mean he was colder than usual and wouldn't Uh, talk to me in public. I mean, when we were alone in the room and I would ask him simple yes or no questions, he was absolutely silent. How was your day? Nothing. You doing okay? Stonewall. Laying in bed. Hey, did I do something? How come you're not talking to me anymore? Not a peep, except the laughter of people with friends out in the hallway. And to this day, I can't explain why he was silent. And I was an outsider to the sport, an outsider to the cool kids, an outsider to my own friend. 
So I've, I've got some basketball sign-ups. Anyone want to sign up for camp? It's a great time. Adults, well, let me, let me go here first. Teenagers, you are some of the bravest, toughest people I know. You endure such cruelty in such formative stages of your life. Did I get invited to that group? Will those people think that I'm cool? Maybe I need to dress more like her, talk more like him. I'm just so tired of being an outsider. Or perhaps you're on the inside, but to get there, you had to drop a few friends or hide your real personality and do a few misdeeds. It's so hard to be an outsider. Adults, are we that different? We feel like outsiders too, don't we? You ever feel alone or isolated, misunderstood, rejected? Social media, social media can be so antisocial, right? It can make us feel like our lives don't stack up to everyone else's. Marketing gurus fill us with perpetual discontent about the things that we don't have. We're medi- we feel mediocre at our jobs, dissatisfied in our marriage, stiff-armed by our kids. And it's that haunting feeling that's always there that maybe we are not enough that causes us to exclude other people. Well, at least I'm smart, or oh well, at least my kids are better than hers, or I'm wealthier, buffer, and godlier. Well, with all the canceling and shouting and prejudging and division in our culture, I'm beginning to think we are a world of outsiders just dying to find our way in. We're all just a a 13-year-old boy who needs a friend, looking for a place to belong. I guess we're not much different than the man we just read about in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts 8.26, we read that Philip had a divine appointment to keep. As God often does, he called Philip away from fruitful ministry in Samaria to a desert place on the road to Gaza. So, verse 27, And Philip rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. There are two ways in which this precious man is an outsider. He is a geographical outsider, and he is a spiritual outsider. Geographically, he was an Ethiopian. This is modern Sudan, not modern Ethiopia. And Ethiopians in the Bible were exotic. The the Bible kind of describes them as tall, dark, smooth, skinned, it actually says, and handsome. Maybe uh, today's equivalent, if Chris were here, of, I I would tell you, an Italian, all right? Uh, Ancient historians called Ethiopia the edge of the civilized world. I think maybe Josephus or somebody says that. Romans were just starting to explore way down there. And it was a five-month journey to the kingdom of Candace from Jerusalem. So this man had come all that way to worship the living God. This geographical outsider was looking for something in Israel's God. But he had a problem. He was a spiritual outsider. He was a eunuch. A eunuch is a man whose body has been altered so that he can no longer become a father. Ancient people thought that eunuchs made good palace servants. They could care for the king's wives without polluting the king's line. Eunuchs would also have very close physical access to rulers. They'd be bodyguards or uh, household servants or groomers. And because of their close proximity, they would often gain the ear and confidence of the king become very trusted positions. Think of Nehemiah, the cupbearer to the king. But because they were poor and had limited connections, they could be easily disposed of if they came to a point of disagreement with the ruling class. In addition, because they did not have wives or children, they had fewer family loyalties that could make them disloyal. And they had no aspiration of forming their own dynasty because they couldn't have children. So this eunuch 
served in the height of the power of Queen Candace, but he was disposable, wed to his work, with no hope of ever having a family. What's more, it's unlikely that he could fully convert to Judaism. He worshipped Israel's God, but the law of Moses in Deuteronomy prohibited eunuchs from entering the temple area. He traveled five months just to worship at the temple. He longed to be near his maker, to sing with God's people, to gaze upon God's house. He pulled into Jerusalem on his chariot and he caught sight of the magnificent temple. But as his adrenaline began to surge, so too did his sadness. The closer he got, the further away he felt. Step, 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 stop. He broke down at the gate to the temple precinct. He was overwhelmed by the beauty of God, with longing for friendship with God, and with the ache in his soul that he would never fully be invited in. To some extent, he would remain an outsider to God's people. Man, the thoughts that had to be pummeling this man's mind as he uh, read the Isaiah scroll on his way out of Jerusalem on that dry, dusty desert road. Well, let's read verses 28 through 35. He was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. This is absolutely amazing. This is the first recorded account of personal evangelism, and it is a keeper. Can you picture this beautiful, black, exotic court official seated next to an excited, olive-skinned man who talks with his hands? Their feet are bouncing up and down, hanging out the trunk as they dig deep into the Isaiah scroll. It's this picture of racial harmony, compliments of God's word that they're centered around and God's spirit which brought them together. And what do we discover? Well, the eunuch tells us that parts of the Old Testament are mystery. They point to a time or a person no one quite understood. Generations of scribes had debated who this Isaiah 53 passage referred to. Was it, was it Isaiah who suffered? Because he brought God's word to the people. Was it the nation of Israel? Or might it be somebody else? Well, whoever it was, the Ethiopian was desperate to know. And here's why I think he cared so much. When you read a historical account of the Bible like this, and you know that God has totally set the scene up. He's arranged everything, right? You have to ask yourself, why did God have the eunuch reading this text? I mean, Isaiah 53 is a big section. It's got... And so why these verses, right? There are plenty of famous quotes in Isaiah 53 like this. We all like sheep have gone astray. Or he could have had him read, he was pierced for our transgressions. Or this one, he will prosper and afterwards divide the spoil. Why this one? Well, I think the Ethiopian made a special connection with this suffering lamb of God. Emphasis on suffering. It says, in His humiliation, justice was denied him. That's where the unit lived, right? Injustice and humility. But here's the real kicker. You see that phrase in verse 33? Who can describe his generation? 
think the NIV has a better translation. It says, it translates it like this. Who can say anything about his children? For his life was taken from the earth. Ding, 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 ding. You see the connection there? Like the eunuch, this mysterious figure was violently oppressed so that he had no descendants, no children, no kids like the eunuch. Who is this guy, the eunuch thinks? I simply have to know. But he's stuck, right? He saw this key historical figure, the one God would use to transform the world, but, but one who could also relate to his shame, his injustice, his humility and ache. But verse 31, the eunuch says, how can I understand this unless somebody guide me? Well, the apostle Peter uh, implied that even Isaiah himself was not entirely sure who this marvelous person was. 1 Peter 1.10 says, the prophets, like Isaiah, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So the prophets themselves didn't always know who they foretold. So the eunuch, the prophets, you and me, need a key to unlock the glorious mysteries of the Old Testament. The Old Testament hints at a person that we just gotta know. And we need a guide to teach us who he is. And do you know when the first guide appeared? Before Luke wrote Acts, he wrote the Gospel of Luke. In Luke 24, he tells the story of the first guy to explain the mysteries of the Old Testament. Luke 24 is so similar to the story of the Ethiopian eunuch that I believe Luke wants us to recall it, Luke 24, while we read this. So here are the parallels. You got people journeying on the road away from Jerusalem. Sound familiar? They were incredibly confused about Jesus, and they needed someone to explain it to them. In Luke 24, they could not make sense of Jesus' crucifixion and subsequent appearances. So a prophet draws near to explain. It's Jesus himself in Luke 24. And this is what Jesus does. Look at how similar it is to verse 35. And Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And this is the key part. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then finally, in both stories, the prophet performs a sacrament. Uh, Philip, baptism. Jesus probably shares the Lord's Supper with these people. And then the prophet disappears. From their sight. See, Jesus is the guide and he's the key to Scripture. The wonderful secret of all the Old Testament hopes ain't secret no more. It's unlocked by Jesus' death and resurrection. And so the Bible's not primarily a book of fables to instill morality in children, it's not a catalog of heroes for us to venerate. It's not a book on how to leverage God for a better life, and it's not even a book on how to be spiritual. All 1,167 pages point to one guide, one key, one central Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Luke goes out of his way to show that what Jesus did in his flesh in the book of Acts, or in the book of Luke, chapter 24, he does through the Spirit. He does the exact same thing through the Spirit uh, in the book of Acts. He's again explaining that he is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament hopes. But this time, he does it in the Spirit through a faithful servant. Jesus longed for the Ethiopian eunuch to know him. So he pursued that guy through an evangelist named Philip. Jesus pursued this geographical and spiritual outsider. Somehow, way out on the fringes of the known world, Israel's God laid hold of the heart of an Ethiopian eunuch and drew him with cords of love to his house in Jerusalem. God made his soul hungry for salvation. He wanted to give himself to the living God. 
And when he left the temple, he thought that that was as close to the living God as he ever was going to get. But little did he know that God was not in that temple anymore. The temple was just the preview of the main event, Jesus. Jesus taught that we no longer come to him through a building, but through Jesus alone. That he dwells among you, his people, by giving us the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit didn't barricade this good news in the walls of a church. The Spirit was coming for the eunuch. After Philip uh, saw the Spirit turn Samaria upside down, the Spirit then set its pinpoint laser focus on a lonely Ethiopian traveler. He told Philip, get out there, wait by the road, and then moved him to run alongside God's beloved foreigner. Jesus' perfect timing had him reading Isaiah 53 out loud, like ancient people do, so that Philip could ask the no-brainer, easiest, low-hanging fruit evangelistic question of the century. Does that passage make sense? And they were on. And there deep underneath that ancient poem, the Ethiopian found the depth of Jesus' love for outsiders like him. He saw Jesus silenced, whipped, and beaten in Isaiah 53. He saw the world gasp in horror at his mangled body and his humiliation. And no doubt, he finally came to understand why Jesus did all that. Jesus became an outsider to befriend outsiders. He came all the way from heaven to die as a reject and an outcast and a criminal. Jesus met that Ethiopian where he was on the outskirts of Jerusalem on a miserable little torture site called Golgotha. He pursued outsiders like the eunuch Until the point when he took our place, suffering for our sin, so that we would no longer be outsiders, so that we could be brought near to God as his holy children. That's the good news Philip shared with the unit. And Luke wants his reader, Theophilus, to know this as well. Theophilus can relate to a guy like the Ethiopian eunuch. He too is a God-fearing Gentile, and likely a wealthy government official. Jesus became an outsider to reach you, Theophilus. And what about you? Do you know that you too have been individually pursued by Jesus? Perhaps it's that sense that you don't quite belong. That fear or that experience of rejection or that broken space in your heart you just can't fix. Perhaps you've come here to God's temple today hoping that God could meet an outsider like you. Luke wants you to know that he has. He went all the way to the cross to meet you. And he will meet you here today. All you need to do is trust in Jesus and be baptized. The eunuch is once again a fine example. Let's read verses 36 through 40. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. How many of you guys saw that little pool out in the yard as you were coming in? Uh, That's uh, that's our little Fulton family pool, lots of good times. It's got a leak in it, so my son was like keeping his finger on the, the air leak like during the whole service out there. But we were able to see seven people baptized into the name of Jesus Christ this morning. They saw the pool and they said, hey, there's water. What's to prevent us from being baptized? And we did it. And we've said uh, that if you believe in Jesus Jesus as your Lord and your Savior and that he's died for your sins, then there's nothing to prevent you from being baptized. If you've never done that, uh, I would encourage you to take that step of obedience to Christ that signals you out as belonging to him 
and, uh, and, um, and that he has saved you. It's a really meaningful um, rite that the, and, and, and sacrament that the Lord gives us. They each told the, the elders the story of how Jesus found them and gave them life. And he will do the same thing for you if you trust in him. Well, at the beginning of Acts, uh, Jesus foretold that the gospel would spread like this, that the disciples would first be witnesses in Jerusalem. You've heard this, right? In Jerusalem and Judea. And then it would go broad, more broad to Samaria, uh, Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, the apostles did a fine job in Jerusalem and Judea. And then Philip had uh, just an amazing evangelistic ministry in Samaria. And, um, but here we see the first person from the uttermost parts of the world being reached. But of all the people that God could choose for that, that key moment where he breaks out into the farthest reaches of the world, why did he set his sights on an Ethiopian eunuch? Well, first let me tell you this was not just a random choice. God had been planning this for thousands of years. He first revealed his plan to save all the nations in the 12th chapter of the Bible when he promised Abraham that his descendant would bless all the families of the earth. And so God, sort of like a boyfriend with that engagement ring in his pocket, he's sitting on this secret that he cannot wait to share with the world. And after millennia, the, fi- the time has finally come on this dusty road. Well, there were plenty of hints and previews in the Old Testament of the day when all nations would be blessed by Abraham's descendant. But to take the cake as we think about the Ethiopian. First is the queen of Sheba. This is another African queen like the eunuch's master, Candace. And she visits Solomon, the king, at his temple at Jerusalem. She's overwhelmed by his wisdom and his kingdom and his wealth. But she leaves with some gifts and only the memory of Israel's God. The next person is Naaman. He's another high-ranking Gentile, a foreign official, who has leprosy. It's a condition like the eunuchs, which makes him an outcast. Like Philip, God's messenger baptized Naaman many years previously in the Jordan River to cleanse him And then he becomes a worshiper of God. And as a beautiful testimony up to his conversion, he takes a cart full of Israelite soil back to Assyria so that he can worship Israel's God on Israel's dirt. That's how much he wants to be near Israel's God. But it's also this signal that he's away from the presence of God at the temple. So the Queen of Sheba leaves Israel with a memory. Naaman left Israel with some dirt. How differently the eunuch would leave. He went on his way rejoicing, forever cleansed by Jesus Christ, sealed by the waters of baptism. Unlike Naaman or the queen, he was not leaving God's presence. He took it with him. God's presence lived within him when Jesus claimed him as his own. But there's one more Old Testament text which you've got to read with me today. It explains why the Ethiopian eunuch was the first foreigner which God targeted for salvation. It's uh, through Jesus Christ. It's three chapters after the passage that he was reading. So he was reading Isaiah 53. This comes from Isaiah 56. Uh, And I like to picture him uh, back in the chariot after Philip disappears, continuing to read on in the Old Testament with new eyes and a new song in his voice, In Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 8, he would have read this. Let not the foreigner, foreigner, even Ethiopians? Yes. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch, that's me. Let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. How many times have I been called that name? For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls 
wait a minute. I'm finally invited in? I will give you a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. Sons and daughters? That hits so close to the pain. But I trust you, God. The Lord goes on to say, The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others, that's me, to him besides those already gathered. Can you believe that? What a great plan God had to extend his gospel to the ends of the earth. And so the eunuch concludes, I always wondered how foreigners and eunuchs could ever enter the temple. I never knew when God would gather outcasts to himself. But I no longer wonder. I have believed and been baptized into Christ. I am no longer an outsider. I am his. I wonder what names people call you. I wonder what names you call yourself. Dry tree, foreigner, clumsy, ugly, tainted goods, broken, stupid, disappointment, average, guilty, unlovable. If you are baptized into Jesus, you have a new name. Christ's. You have Christ's name. You are no longer an outsider. You are his. Acts 8 shows us that Jesus is breaking through every barrier to pursue people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And he still does so today. He may be seeking you today just like he did on that dusty road. If you've never responded to him in faith, believe. Come talk to us. And then, get baptized. In some ways, I don't think we ever grow past being 12 or 13. Desperately craving acceptance, while insecure people haze us and prank us and give us the silent treatment. But that doesn't define you anymore. If you could see with heaven's eyes, then you would remember that Christ has made his home with you. You are accepted and will never be alone until the end of the age and beyond. So cherish your Savior, love his love, and be ready. Be ready when God takes you off the beaten path and plops you down next to a stranger or someone beautifully different from you. Be ready to invite them into your heart to Uh, scoot upside them in their chariot. Be ready to invite them to the key of all the scriptures, to Jesus Christ. Because seven baptisms like we had today is wonderful, but God wants to fill that rinky-dink little pool out there with countless outsiders who have come home. Let's pray. Lord, the uh, incredible value you place on this outsider, this Ethiopian eunuch. All the trouble you went to for millennia to plan for a way to rescue him from his sin. And all the detailed planning that you did to have Philip be there at the perfect time to bring the gospel to him. And Father, you put the same care and attention and detail into each of our salvations. Our story of coming to trust in you is equally miraculous and it comes from the same heart of passionate love that rescued that Ethiopian from his sin. Father, I pray that we would not take this salvation lightly. I pray that we would recognize that we have been brought inside the family, that we are no longer outsiders, but we are yours. Father, people who get that, people who believe that, aren't controlled by culture. They're not intimidated by others. They they don't live in fear and cowering, um, but they're able to find joy in who they are in Christ. And so, Lord, make us a people of joy. And we pray that our joy and our gospel proclamation would overflow here in Naperville so that many, many lost, confused, hurting people like us 
can become part of your family. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.